Today, we're talking about all things Celsius. That's right. It's time to put Alex Mashinsky in the hot seat. He is a very well-known person in enterprise, in blockchain, and in business generally. Thank you very much, Alex, for being here today. Thanks for having us. Not a problem. So as I said before, Alex, you are leading something. You're the CEO of the Celsius Network. It's something that's innovative. It's something that is more than just experimental. It's something to change status quo for banking. Your slogan is banking on the blockchain. Tell us a bit about exactly what you want to do. Why did you start the Celsius Network? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we, we, I've been a coin holder for a long time, uh, several years. Uh, invested in many different projects and and when you look at Bitcoin which is uh, actually today uh, is 10 years old uh, today is the birthday for Bitcoin right it's exactly 10 years old uh, it only has 6 million active uh, wallets about 26 million downloads of wallets activated wallets but only 6 million of them have transacted uh, in the last several months so that is a very slow adoption, right? And, and part of the reason that it has such slow adoption is because it really did not do well as a, po a form of payment. It's only used to their store value. So people that believe that it's going to increase in value basically buy it and hope that over time it will uh, appreciate, right? But right. we think that for it to become a, a, a standard platform, a global platform on which uh, people can rely, as both a form of payment and a store of value, you need to bring at least 100 million people to the blockchain. And, and when I looked at the, all the different companies that were trying to solve this, uh, like you said uh, previously, right before we got on this uh, podcast, was right. that uh, most of them are just trying to line their, up the, their pockets. They're taking businesses that exist in the real world, they're injecting some blockchain into them, and they're pretending like it's a blockchain business. But exactly. The opportunity is really to reinvent the business. It's reinventing the banking business. It's reinventing the uh, financial services, right? In by using blockchain in a new way. And Celsius really was created to do everything in the best interest of the community. So I think even today, even though there's 5,000 uh, ICOs and different blockchain projects out there. I don't think any project can come up here and say, we're doing everything in the best interest of growing the community. Right. Well, let's talk about that. You referenced Bitcoin. So I want to talk about that in the context of what it evolved from that, and that is Ethereum. You're utilizing Ethereum as part of your own system. Talk us through that in why you chose Ethereum, why, why it's a proof of stake system that's going to, be, going to evolve to that, because currently it's still proof of work why that is so beneficial to your model. Right, so, so we, the Celsius wallet is available on Android and then on the App Store, it's an app that you download to your phone. It actually supports uh, the top 20 coins. So uh, our cell token runs on Ethereum, but we support Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin and uh, Ripple and a bunch of other different uh, 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 blockchains uh, because we're not here to pick win and losers. Our job is to really support the entire community and let the, let the community decide who they're betting on and who they're supporting and so on. But uh, we selected the, the Ethereum as the basically the rails on which we're going to provide a lot of our services because I think Ethereum has the best chance of being that platform, of being the, the foundation uh, to enable transactions, to enable smart contracts, and to enable uh, all the services that we're trying to provide. So right. instead of instead of going on EOS on or uh, you know or some of the other uh, uh, more uh, younger platforms that are out there, I think uh, the developer community on Ethereum is much more robust, ten times bigger than the second um, uh, most popular uh, uh, project out there. Right, and that makes a lot of sense, given, as you said, you're looking at a track record, you've done your homework. And just to reiterate what you're saying, that's purely from a tech position. You've chosen that as the, for an ERC-20 standard. But for, in terms of utilizing cryptocurrencies, as the term is currently, you're going to be opening that up to a multitude, I would imagine, of currencies to be able to transact. How many do you currently have on your, in, on your books? So I, I, yeah, so, so we support, currently we have 12 different uh, coins that we are already accepted from, from depositors. 
Uh, so the most popular ones, again, like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin or Ripple, you can deposit directly through the app and you just open it, you get an address, you deposit, and it starts earning interest immediately. Several other ones that are not yet supported by BitGo, which is our custodian, we have to do an off-chain transaction. So basically, we have to give you a unique address and then you have to manually go and do that. You cannot do it through the app. You have to do it uh, through a different mechanism. And, and uh, we, we are working on adding these other uh, coins into the wallet. Uh, and it's just, gonna, it's just a technical issue of making sure the security is there, that all the services are available on all, every, every blockchain. So, like, for example, we just launched the CellPay service where you can send money to anybody yes. on the planet. Uh, we just launched it today, so you, you get an exclusive on that. Thank you. I was going to ask you about that. First one, first one to, uh, to, we go, to go live with, and, and uh, all of our coins uh, are supported, right? So it doesn't matter if you want to send somebody Bitcoin or Ripple or anything else. The recipient doesn't have to know anything about the coin. It doesn't have to have the wallet. Like, setting up a Ripple wallet is actually not that trivial, right? And, 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 and knowing how to do the unique uh, identifier and all kind of other unique things that Ripple has, that if you don't set it up properly and you don't know what you're doing, you're actually going to lose your coin, right? Right. Or sending an ERC-20 uh, coin into a wallet that, doesn't, that is a, a uh, you know, Ethereum wallet, but it may not support ERC-20, you're going to lose those coins. So we're basically hiding all that complexity behind an interface that is the same like sending an SMS to a friend. Right. And, and, and by sorry. doing that, really eliminating all the complexity and all of the, you know, like a, <laughs> I sent coins to my kids and they lost them. So <laughs> when you see that, you know that the industry is just not ready for scale. Right. And you're trying to make it more seamless. But Alex, in that respect, I also want to talk to you about usership. Now, how can having that feature really build out the potential for mass adoption? Because obviously that's adding to and compounding to your overall value in achieving this goal. Right. So, so today, the, I would say 90% of all the transactions on the blockchain are uh, uh, coin holders who are hodlers or who are speculators sending coins to each other, uh, uh, not as a form of payment, but rather as a transaction related to store of value. So they're, they're buying or selling, hoping that the coin is going to go up or hoping that the coin is going to go down. And, right. and I think that represents a very small percentage of the overall use case for cryptocurrencies, right, and digital currencies in general. So what we decided to do, well, one of the first things we decided to do was to allow people to earn interest, right? It's a very simple service. If you go to your bank and they pay you half of 1% and Celsius pays you 5%, which would be 10 times more, you would be much more inclined to take your money, put it into Ethereum or Bitcoin and earn 5% interest. So that's a service we offer. It's a very simple service. You don't have to know anything. You have to do anything. You just take coins, you put them in Celsius, instead of them being on an exchange or them sitting in cold storage, and they start earning interest. Every time you look at your wallet, your balance is higher, and, and you don't have to trade them, you don't have to send them to anyone, you don't have to speculate. Right. Well, let's talk about that, though. I want to really dig deep. You mentioned the, the very point of hodling, and that equates to SOV or store of value. So let's talk about that in the context of putting our money into a wallet. So whether it be crypto or fiat, let's just talk about the concept for a moment. The benefit of being able to put uh, crypto into your wallet means that there, you pr provide interest for those who are treating that as a store of value. So, Alex, how do we move on from store of value if people are just seeking the interest? as they have been, no doubt, by looking at uh, the whole landscape as an investment system. Well, so, so look at the dollar. The dollar has hundreds of trillions of dollars in denominated assets in dollars. Most of those assets are not, sit, are not being moved every day. It's not like Visa or MasterCard is moving most of the dollars, right? Most of the dollars are either locked up in savings accounts or they are being used, for example, to buy commodities like oil or, or gas or, or natural resources or things like that. And all those are dominate, uh, denominated in dollars, right? So, the, so commerce, commerce around the world in general is denominated in this currency. And what, what we're trying to do is bring as many things to be denominated in Bitcoin or in Ethereum, right? And we think that there's a lot of opportunity for financial products 
to, to to be denominated in in Bitcoin because bit if again it's ten year anniversary. Right. Sure. If, but if you plotted if you plotted the Bitcoin against the dollar over ten years, the dollar lost ninety nine percent of its value over the last ten years. So if you put all of your assets in Bitcoin, you did exceptionally well. Right. right. But as you said, sorry to interrupt, but as you mentioned quite rightly, it's been the perspective for many of the people interacting with Bitcoin has been from that uh, SOV standpoint, from that uh, almost security sense standpoint where they're looking for investment. We haven't yet seen that ecosystem build for a robust utility based uh, interaction or, or, or system. So in that right. respect, once again, how do we move if we, if say for example, I'm a hodler and I'm a proponent of the Celsius network and I decide to uh, reap the benefits of the five to seven percent in interest? Uh, how what what incentivizes well, you, me? You're then helping the community. So let let me. So the sure. second service we offered, which was about two months ago, was dollar lending. So basically, if you have coins, uh, you have access to very low cost loans, five percent per year. Try to get a 5% loan uh, per year without a credit check, without an income check, without signing your personal life guarantee on it and, your, and maybe even your family co-signing for you so you could get that loan. Here, we, we, we are taking an asset we, that we think is very valuable and we basically make it fungible, meaning you can actually borrow dollars against that. So now the use case for Bitcoin is 10 times bigger because loans, almost everybody on the planet needs a loan. Right, and and giving people a loan at five, six, seven percent per year is a fraction of what people are paying today. Most of your viewers have never in their life received a loan for five percent. Right. So here, here, all you, all you have to do is KYC. You download the app. You do KYC, meaning you just scan your passport or your driving license. You deposit coins, and you immediately get a loan. It's that simple. Right. right. You don't have to have a bank account. You don't have to open a bank account. You don't have to sit for four hours and fill up forms and do all kinds of stuff. So the use case for what I just described for loans is bigger than the entire crypto community put together. Right. Okay. And clearly what all you... Small businesses, right? Everybody on the planet who will look at this and say, you mean all I have to do is buy some coins and then I can get access to this really, really cheap source of capital? Of course right. I'll do that. Right. So, and, and clearly the fuel is the hodling. Without the hodling, with those that are right. willing to support. So the people that are hodling, a lot, giving us a pool of assets, right? They're, they're basically staking the Bitcoin and the Ether with us. Right. And, and it's not just Ether, right? They're also staking the Bitcoin. And we, when we have a pool of Bitcoin and we have a pool of Ether and we have a pool of Litecoin, then we go to banks and financial institutions and show it to them and say, hey, look, we've got $100 million or more of these assets. Will you lend us? Uh, against this and big companies Apple raised hundreds of billions of dollars right I mean they raised billions of dollars at three or four percent that's all they pay on their notes you know right three or four percent and then these are 20 year notes right. so so when you have a lot of money you can borrow at a very low rate Right. And that's why we can land at very low rates as well. Well, Alex, let's talk about that in the context of collateral. It's mentioned on your website very clearly that you can collateralize the asset itself. How innovative is that? That's a really big deal if, you, if we could really unpack this for the audience because sure. it's not just currency, it's not just commodity anymore, but it's actually collateral that people can actualize and use through you. Exactly. So, so we, we are not the first to do collateral uh, against, uh, I think Salt was the first one, right? right. So there was another company that kind of, uh, they just got to market ahead of us. But the big difference between us and all the other people who are trying to do this is that, for example, Salt or anyone else, they charge you 18 or 20%. So we charge half or a quarter of what the other guys charge. Why? Because our focus is on growing a community. All the other guys' focus is on maximizing profit. They're just trying to fill their pockets, right? We take all the 5% we take as income by charging you interest we distribute that to the proof of stake, to all the people who stake their coin. So most of the money that comes in to Celsius immediately goes out to, back to the community, where with Salt and other companies, all the money they collect in interest, which is three or four times more than us, goes to the pocket of the rich people who own those companies. Right. The bank, the financial so, institutions. 
So in that respect, are you redefining the very construct of a bank to be more exactly. a social bank? And if you are, I want to talk about your background now. It is important we broached the success that you had as a, as a co-founder and inventor of VoIP. I really want to talk about that because you no doubt have a reason behind this. Something's driving you that's beyond the, the blockchain. What is it, Alex? And why are you so uh, focused <laughs> well, on giving back? Look, I'm an immigrant. I, I came to this country with nothing, you know, I, I, uh, you know, to the United States 30 years ago. And, and, and again, it's the land of opportunities. Unfortunately, most people around the planet do not have the opportunity to just hop on a plane and land in America and start a business and be successful. And, and, and it's very important for me to give back. It's very important for me to extend these opportunities worldwide. And I would say 30 years ago, the chance of anyone around the world having the same opportunity as somebody in the United States was zero. But today, because the internet, because of the blockchain, it's actually the same opportunity. Again, like, for example, these loans that we're talking about, they're fungible in the United States or outside the United States in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. A person in the U.S. and a person in Australia where you are gets exactly the same access. A person in Vietnam has exactly the same access and the same cost of, 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 of basically taking advantage of these loans. So, so the reason I'm so excited about this is, like you said, in, in, in the early 90s, I saw the internet, I saw the opportunity to make voice free, right? Back then, voice used to cost three or four dollars a minute to call around the world. And the phone companies were these giant monopolies who decided how much they charge you and, and, and really ripped off everybody around the planet. And mm -hmm. now we're doing this call between me and you and it's free, right? right? And no one is paying for it, right? I mean, you're paying internet access in Australia. I'm paying a little bit of internet access in, in the US and that's about it. Right. So, so voice of IP, the idea was free voice, right? And, and money over IP or MOIP is free money. And money should not be controlled by government or by banks. Just because it was controlled by banks for 700 years doesn't mean we have to continue letting them control it tomorrow. Right. After all, look, I mean, banks take your deposit, right? They give you half of 1% per year. They then turn around and lend me your money. They don't lend me their money. They lend me your money, your money mm. charge me 24% on my credit card, and they keep 23% in profit, right? So they make 90% of the value there. And what we looked at this said, wait, why can't we lower the cost to the borrower, increase the, what we pay back to the depositor, right? So pay you three or four or 5%, charge much less to the borrower, and take a much smaller sliver, right? Which, which would still plenty for Celsius, mm -hmm. right? Just like with VoIP, there's plenty of money for this company. We're using Zoom right now. Zoom is doing extrem extremely well, right? Even though they don't charge anything for the service, right? So, so, uh, so I think we, we just need to change the business model from traditional model that we get used to, big banks, big monolithic banks with big branches and, and big fees, into something that is free and is in the best interest of the community. That's the key. Right. Well, let's talk about the resistance. Clearly, there's a correlation between government and big banks right now. Have you encountered in, in the high sort of uh, position that you're in as a CEO, not just of this company, but of others, have you encountered the kind of resistance that we would imagine from our sort of viewpoint when they're trying to stop someone like you, given that you're breaking down the current <laughs> centralized model? Right. Well, you, all you need to do is watch some of the uh, debates that I did with Nouriel Rubini or mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, like b the back and forth with like Jamie Dimon or other people who basically call this whole industry a scam or fraud or something that is, uh, uh, they're scaring the people, right? They're trying to scare a whole generation from joining and benefiting from the blockchain and from digital currency. It's they're doing that because they're, you know, they have a lot to lose. I mean, Jamie Dimon is the largest bank in the world. If people stop depositing money tomorrow in, in Chase, JP Morgan, they will be out of business. Their entire business is, is dependent on people not knowing that they can earn 10 times as much uh, and actually take control of their finances. Right. And I think you also raised some important uh, banks there as well, because with JP Morgan, they are also heavily investing in blockchain. 
And that's the irony. They're looking at quorum. They're looking at different aspects to benefit themselves. There's no question of that. But the, the, again, I really want to reinforce this point we're making that you're about reformulating the construct of banking itself to be more, more socially aware and socially supportive, uh, to be much more decentralized in that sense. So it's one thing to use blockchain. It's another thing to change the game for the people. And that's what you're really about. Today, again, is the 10th anniversary. Satoshi Nakamoto, she did not create blockchain for JP Morgan to be more profitable, right? If you read the white paper and you pay attention to what it's all about, mm. you will see it's very simple, right? It's about, it's basically saying we don't have a chance convincing JP Morgan to do everything in our best interest. It's just not going to happen. We're wasting our time. So, we cannot create a bank with all the regulatory and, and other uh, uh, restrictions that exist inside the government laws and, and national central banks. We need to create a whole nother system. And what Satoshi did is put together several very interesting technologies that existed since the 70s, right? Some of them since the 80s. And the seminal wh uh, white paper about the blockchain is actually Scott Stornetta, 1991 in Belcourt. Right, it's one of the references on page nine. Yes, and he's an advisor. Paper. He's an advisor. He's an advisor to us. But I'm saying, like, these are not new technologies, right? No. And Satoshi comes and puts it all together and says, here, here is a beautiful engine that is external, completely unattached to the central banks or to the existing financial institutions. And it can run on its own. And it can enable peer-to-peer -peer transactions where each individual can own their own value and decide what to do with it in a completely independent way from the financial institutions, right? Right. And, and so, that, so that is the key, that is the key difference. And people now have to decide, do I continue and trust the dollar and continue and trust the, the banks in the United States or in Europe or in Asia? Or do I switch into this new mechanism, which is the blockchain, right? And very few people have switched. The people who have switched have done phenomenally well, right? Mm. The people who have not switched are sitting there and saying, well, it's probably too late. It's already up so much. It used to be $10. Now it's $6,000. How do I know it's the right time to come in? So what Celsius does, Celsius comes and says, forget about the price of the Bitcoin. How about a cheap loan? How about interest income? How about being able to make a payment to anyone on the planet, even if they do not have a crypto account? It doesn't matter if they have an Ethereum wallet or if they have a Bitcoin wallet. You don't have to have one and they don't have to have one. You guys can send each other value through the Celsius system with zero fees and zero friction. The only thing both of you have to do is authenticate yourself to make sure you're not a bad actor because we right. don't want bad actors in the platform. Absolutely. So really, you're trying to encourage people to get involved because you're providing a platform for people to engage in a seamless way. But Alex, how do we go from there to... The, 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 pop, the wider, to engage in a wider discourse whereby people can actually start to engage in purchasing products and services through their crypto. Do you foresee that's an also another level of imperatives that have to happen beyond just simply having a bank? Because obviously yeah. for currency so to I, have any let me, value. Let me, predict, let me predict the order of events, okay? So again, we're now at 6 million active wallets for Bitcoin. We're at about 7 or 8 million active wallets for Ethereum. The overall market cap of the community is about $250 billion. It was as high as $800 billion, right? We, we need stability before people will use it as, as a form of payment. So because we have so much volatility, right? Because we went from, you know, a wave of adoption. The first wave was, was anarchist. Then we got a, a bunch of libertarians. And now we had a massive number of speculators just come and join the crypto community. Right. The spec speculators are not really that helpful, right? All they do is see so the prices up and down, which guarantees that no one will use it as a form of payment. So we need a massive wave of adoption of people that are not speculators. We need hodlers. We need people that just want to use it for, for other purposes like loans, like interest income. And that, by, by de facto, will stabilize the prices. When you have stabilized prices, you can start using it as a form of payment. And when you can use it as a form of payment, you can go to every merchant and say, why are you paying Visa and MasterCard 3%? Here, you, anyone walking in with cell pay, it's instant confirmation. You don't have to wait 10 minutes to get paid. 
It's instant, right? right? If I sent you money right now, it would take two seconds for you to receive it, confirm it, and you're done, right? There's not even, you don't have to wait. So right. it's faster than any merchant. Uh, uh, it's definitely faster than the new credit card that have the, the smart SIM in them, right? That require you to sit, you know, you plug it in and it, and it sits there for 20 seconds and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. Mm. So for the first time, the blockchain is faster than your credit card. Your credit card used to be real fast. You swiped it and you left. Right. Now it's actually slowed down. And Celsius solved the problem of speeding it up a thousand times. It's instant. You can go into a coffee shop, you can send them the, the payment, and it's instantly there, right? So, yeah. but we need stability on the coin. No one wants to uh, basically receive, a, um, you know, charge you twenty dollars but receive nineteen dollars because the coin has moved in the meantime. Right, and so you make a perfect solve point. That problem. You make a perfect point that you, as the service are actually providing that stability. It's not necessarily the technology that provides that, that stability and removing right. that problem of volatility because that's always going to be there while ever we treat it currently as that store of value, as you said, and those speculators who are just simply trying to hope for a, a different price. Than, you know, so we, we now guarantee the price you will receive on the other end. So if you enter $19.82, we guarantee that the merchant or the other person on the other side, when they withdraw it, they will have $19.82. Right. right. That's and, a, that's and by, doing, by doing that, you're solving the last piece of the puzzle. So now we have all the pieces, technically, but we need the mass adoption. And the reason I'm spending all this time going on trade shows and conferences and talking to everyone who will listen mm. is because I'm trying to convince people that this is for you. This is not for me. I already made money. I live in a beautiful apartment. I have a wonderful life. And I'm working around the clock seven days a week to make the community successful because again this is about mass adoption if we don't cross the chasm and bring a hundred million people a hundred million that's a critical mass mm -hmm. right if we don't bring them into crypto if we don't get them to either take a loan or uh, 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 put some money so they can earn interest or use it for payment those are the three key services these are the killer apps right everybody's talking about killer apps what are the killer apps we have three in one wallet Okay, mm. that's available for everybody on the planet, right? People can download it right now and they can start using the service. And, and right. what we really need is every one of your users to send a penny to 10 other people, right? Just to have them experience. People that do not have a crypto wallet. Because the minute they have that experience, they receive $20 or $5, they open it, it's there, and they can send it to someone else instantly. They will see, wow, why am I using a bank? It takes, today I made a deposit in the bank. The guy told me, it will take five days to clear. And I laughed at him. I said, wait a second. This is a check. You can call the bank and see that the money is there. I know you will have this money in your account, the bank, today. They will, it will clear in your network today. But you're going to hold it for, away from me for five days so you can make a profit on it. Right? right. So, so, and this is a check for $68,000. So you know, it's about, so the bank it's also is going to hold my money for five days just because I don't have an alternative. Right. If that's I also about. I would not use the bank. Sure, and it's also about breaking that psychology down as well, Alex. Because obviously, this has been millennia in the making. The this kind of dogma that everything should be centralised. You're breaking those those uh, sort of traditions down. Those ways of thinking. But let's now talk about some inherent parts of your system. One of them is custodian as well, with regard to storage and safety, security. I want to talk about how are you going to ensure that the, the coins themselves, the people, uh, I guess, uh, in purchase are safe and stored properly? Right. So, so when, you, when you launch the app, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the screen here, but I'll try. I'll, I'll make sure I put a copy of it up for you. Right. So when, when you launch the app, basically, uh, mm -hmm. you, can, you can go and enter, for example, if I want to make a deposit of, uh, of BTC, yeah. I can just go and, and enter the, you know, I get an address, right? The system gives me an address to which I can deposit. The point is that, it's, that it, the address automatically comes from BitGo. And we use BitGo because... This address right here is not a Celsius address. It's not some uh, broker in the middle. It's not an exchange, mm -hmm. right? All of our deposits go immediately into BitGo, which is the, one of the oldest and most secure uh, custodians out there, right? 
uh, Kraken is using BitGo, a bunch of different exchanges. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange is using BitGo. So when any, all, any of these people need to store their coins, it, it goes to one of the safest guys. The SEC recently uh, approved BitGo as a custodian. So we chose actually the most expensive one. They're not the cheapest one, right? right. We chose the most expensive service because we knew that they will provide great value for our customers. Right? Well, that's, good, that's good to know for, for that reason because people do need right. to be able to trust as much as possible. Exactly. But I also want to talk about underwriting as well. We talked about the volatility previously about the, the current uh, cryptocurrencies out there. What are you doing to ensure that people aren't putting their, their crypto at risk with regard to already the inherent problems with the significant volatility we've seen just at this year with a significant decline generally of market movement, of market prices? Right. So, we, we, so we, we, our job is to make sure that we do not put the coins that people trust us, right, that the, they stake with us at risk. And the way we do that is we only issue loans. First, we, you have to have crypto. And second, you have to provide the crypto to us as collateral. So we only do asset-backed loans, right? You have to give me a liquid asset, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash. Those are the only four we accept. Mm -hmm. For the loans, I put them in the wallet. I put them in a safe place. And then against that, I issue a, a dollar loan. You don't repay the loan, I can always liquidate the coins you gave me and make my, my community whole. Because it's not that Celsius loses money. Here, Celsius lends on behalf of the community. We are the trusted party that everybody says, hey, Celsius, make sure you do a great job and don't give loans to people that can't repay them. Make sure you have enough collateral so we don't have to do any collection. And that's right. why the rates are so low. The rates are so low because the people that lend to Apple they know they don't need to do collections. They know Apple will pay the bill. Same way here, we can charge low rates because we know the people that give us crypto collateral is going to be sufficient to return the loan, the value of the loan. And we usually, we don't give more than 50 cents on the dollar. So I see. Every, every uh, dollar that is lent out has $2 worth of cryptocurrencies sitting in the safe place in case there is a, you know, we need to liquidate the loan. Right. Well, let's talk about performance because we hear of so many different projects, but very few are actually generating revenue. They're very, very few are doing anything at all other than just talking or building their tech. But how is it actually performing right now, Alex, as you're building out towards major projections? <laughs> well, I'll give you another, another exclusive. Yesterday, Please do. <laughs> we, we, we closed on the largest loan in the industry. We did a single loan of, of over $5 million. That is the largest single loan ever issued to anyone with crypto collateral. Right. Wow. Uh, and this is to an individual. An individual came to us, gave us over $10 million worth of Bitcoin and took uh, over $5 million in, in loan, right? In a dollar loan. So this is an example of, of someone that otherwise would have sold the coin. And if he right. sold the coins, especially $5 million worth of coins, you would have seen when you see those drops uh, in, in, on, on exchanges, that's when somebody just dumps coins because they need the cash, right? right. So, by enabling people to borrow against their asset, we're actually stabilizing the prices of Bitcoin. Because if more and more people are borrowing, then less and less people are selling. If less and less people are selling, the prices are not going to have all this pressure that they have. They're actually going to increase. So are and you finding, why, and are you finding, sorry to interrupt, but are you finding these kinds of investments are more and more commonplace? Not yes. necessarily this large, but you know, is this increasing day in, day out? There's no question. There's no question that with more and more people, both ICOs and individuals and, and whales as well as small people that just come for a thousand dollar loan are doing it because they believe that at $6,300, Bitcoin is undervalued because it costs more than that to mine a Bitcoin. So they're like, hey, it makes no sense. The price is not going to go any lower. Or if it does, it's going to go lower just by a little bit. So I don't right. want to sell my coins, but I need liquidity. I have to buy a car or I have to pay for my kid's college or I have to do something else. What can I do? What mechanism? Someone I can trust who can both give me the access to dollars, but at the same time allow me to retain the upside on my coin. And, and that's it, what we provide. And right? it sounds like also, Alex, that the bear market is actually being quite advantageous for a system like you. And the reason why is because we're not seeing the narrative of people looking for 10x and 100x anymore because the whole system is getting smarter. 
And so for that reason, surely people now are looking more towards that mechanism afforded by someone like you to stabilize the marketplace. Well, we, look, we look more and more like BNB, which is a Binance coin, right? When you look at Binance, right, and you look at how many transactions they're doing, you can almost predict what is the price of BNB, right? Yeah. In the beginning, people were laughing at BNB and saying, ah, this is a joke. Who's going to use these coins that they have and who's going to... And they appreciate it tremendously in value over a long period of time, not over a day, not over a month, but right. now it's over a year. They appreciate it because everybody could see the transactions on the exchange and see that, the, that more and more people were buying the BNB coin to participate in the upside, participate in, in, in the Binance transaction. So Celsius works the same way, right? Mm. Celsius basically issues loans, earns money, returns some of it to the community, and some of it goes back to buy our sell token. We already bought 1.8 million sell tokens off the market, right? With excess capital that we generated, like you said, our wheels are turning. Our flywheel is already operating. We're issuing loans. We accept deposits. We, we are uh, issuing coins for short sellers. So we're creating income and transactions which generate uh, this, uh, uh, income for the coin holders, the people that stake their coin with us, as well as income for Celsius. And what Celsius does with any excess capital is buy, buys back its own sell token. Right. And that, can you tell us why you do that? What's the primary reason why you buy back your token? Well, that's the utility of the token. The token has several utility. One is a membership. So everybody who joins us uh, basically gets a sell token and becomes a member of the community. It's like being a member of, of Costco, right? Mm -hmm. You become a member of Costco and then you run with a big, uh, you know, I don't know if you have Costco in Australia, but in the United no, States, maybe. I don't it, know. It's, it's, it's a warehouse. You know, it's a warehouse with the lowest prices for every product. But you have to be a member to participate. I'm sure right. you have it. I'm sure we, pro we probably do. We probably have yeah, it. But can, something tell us, else. can you tell us why essentially you're buying back those tokens? Like in terms of economics, what's the value in bringing those back into the ecosystem? Is it to increase the right. opportunity so, for membership? Exactly. So, so the, 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 it's the same thing that BNB does. If you look at why, BM, why Binance buys BNB tokens, is because the more tokens uh, Binance buys back, the higher the value of the rest of the token, right? So, so if there's less tokens in the market or coins in their case, right? People have to pay a higher price to buy the rest of the token. Mm. And the price of the BNB token has to do with the total volume of transaction on the Binance exchange. There's a lot of transactions. Everybody knows there's going to be a lot of demand for the BNB token. They go and buy them. The price goes up and it's a cycle that repeats itself. And that's why it went from 14 cents to something mm. like eight or nine dollars, right? Mm. So we are in it for the long term. We're not in it uh, to pop it and pump it and dump it. And, you know, we haven't even listed yet, right? Right, mm. right. We, we are planning to list soon, but we're not in a hurry. I mean, the whole point is to create long term value and convince people long term that this is a viable business right. that generates well, a lot of uh, income. Well, let's talk about now P2P -P or P2P -peer banking because that's emerged pre, well, obviously you've mentioned the blockchain's been around for some time, but P2P -peer banking globally is some, something to be reckoned with. It's a real force. It's, it's viable. It's certainly functioning where I'm from in Australia very well. Are you concerned at all that that exists in, in parallel with what you're doing, Alex, because they don't use a token? They successfully work in a system that is peer-to-peer, -peer, removing some of the middlemen from the equation, but they're not doing it with crypto. Right. So, you know, look, there, there are a lot of different mechanisms and ways to do things. Uh, what I can tell you is that none of these peer-to-peer -peer platforms is doing it in the best interest of the community because it's one-to-one. -one. It's not a community effort. There's no staking by many, many people to create concentrated wealth for everybody, right? So it's not like many people got together, created a pool of capital, which was used to lower the loans to everybody, and now everybody benefits. All peer-to-peer -peer does is matches you with someone who's willing to charge you, the individual, less than what the bank is charging. Now, That's because right. the bank already charges you 10 times more, when somebody comes and charges you only eight times more, you think it's a great deal. All right. But we're, we're saying we're going to charge you a quarter. So a lot of people look at us and say, a quarter, it sounds too good to be true. I'm not taking it. <laughs> too good. Too good to be true. If you, charge, if you charge me more, maybe I will use your service. But you're only charging me 5%. 
that must be a scam. You understand? Yeah. People are so conditioned to paying 20, 25% of their credit card that when you tell them, look, an asset back loan should be 5%. Mm. That's, it shouldn't be more than that. Well, I can tell you. I, I can tell you, I have a teenage daughter. I will be teaching her how to download your app, and it's not to FOMO or anything. It's certainly not to suggest I'm uh, in, in any way paid to do this interview, but I will be, Alex, because I want this narrative to continue, and I at least want her to know that app exists. And I think that also needs to happen more and more where people get exposed to the opportunities to change the, their own way of thinking. Banking, the way we see it today, is just one way of many different forms that can be, and you're leading the way with a new sort of system in place. Let's talk about, well, though... Just to, to, to your point, exactly this hmm. point, right? Banking is the ultimate concentration of, of, of almost like monopolistic powers, right? The banks are these monolithic, gigantic, centralized organizations that accumulate more and more and more power, even though all the power comes from us, the individuals who make the deposits with them. So really, they don't have powers. We just don't know that. Right. And what we're replacing that with, we're replacing it with decentralized process. Now, decentralized doesn't mean peer-to-peer. -peer. Decentralized could be a staking mechanism like the one I just talked about in which the community benefits by pulling it together. Now, we had that. It used to be called a community bank. A community bank was many people pulling their assets together into a bank that was supposed to do a community service. Yeah. They're supposed to do good in the community. Just those, most of those banks disappeared, right? Very, yes. very, very few of us are working with the community bank. So there actually, are, I, there was one in us. Yep. There have even been banks where they've been zero interest as well, Alex, where it was so well uh, designed that it was almost a lottery system where you, some of them had to wait uh, in terms of who could get the loan first, but it was all about community orientation. It was all about trying to access loans where people didn't have to pay any interest at all or very little. They were actually the true concepts of so societies, you know, when we're talking about it from an economic standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And they've all dissipated because of the pressures of, from the top down. Yes. So, so that's exactly it, right? It's all about pulling together the assets. I mean, that's what the banks do. They just pull your assets and they use that to lend to other people and make all the profit. Right. So uh, there's nothing complicated about what we do. And when people look at me and say, but how come no one has done this before? It's because no one, like you said, was willing to stand up to these guys. Because believe me, every day, I get threats and I get phone calls and I get letters from people who tell me cease and desist, you can't do this, what you're doing is not good, you're ruining the party for all of us, why don't you just go and open a bank? And I'm like, look, that's exactly what AT&T told me when I showed them voice of IP, right? They didn't want this to happen. They, right. they were the most profitable company in the world. Back in 1994, when I showed the service to AT&T, they were the most profitable company on the planet. Today, they don't make any money from voice, international voice, right? Wow. So this is what's going to happen with banks. They're just going to have to find profit somewhere else. They're not going to be able to continue ripping off all of us and expect us not to do anything. You know, it's like the movie, The Network, right, where the guy says, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore. Right. So I'm just standing up for the community. Well, let, you know, let's talk about up for all of us. And let's talk about your token now, Alex, because I want to try and understand why fundamentally do you, does the whole system of Celsius Network need to have that particular token? Uh, meaning that could you ha organize this in any other way where you didn't have to have uh, some sort of central mechanism so, so that, that is the token? It's a great question. It's a great question. And I ask the same question of many projects that come to me and say, oh, here is my project. I'm, I'm minting a coin and, and it's going to do great. And Just it's for the go sake of minting times. it. Exactly. I'm like, the coin. I rip out the coin out of their project and the project continue running. Right. So let's talk about why we need a coin here. So first, we need a membership, right? We need to define who's a member, who's not a member, right? Second, we give, using the sell tokens, we give incentive to people who come in early. Meaning if you joined our organization early, you were the first to stake, right? You helped us create this early. You will earn more in interest than the people who came late. So if you took a little bit more risk and you join the project early, you will get the token basically at a lower price and mm -hmm. you will get more of the interest. It's one, basically, our interest is divided into 50% based on how many Bitcoin or Ethereum you have, 25% based on, on 
how long you've been with us, and the time stamp is defined by when you join the community, and we're using the sell token to monetize all of that. Mm -hmm. And the third piece is how many sell tokens do you have? So since you joined us, the clock started right here. We gave you, let's say, 10,000 sell tokens as distribution. Are you hodler? Are you holding them? Or are you selling them as fast as you can? Mm. If you're selling them as fast as you can, a quarter of your income is going to be reduced because your neighbors and your friends who are hodling, who are helping Celsius become bigger and more powerful, are going to get more of that distribution. So when we take the interest and we look at all the hodlers and we use a smart contract to distribute pro rata, the pro rata takes into account how long you've been with us and how many sell tokens do you have. So I these see. are mechanisms that give incentives to the hodlers and disincentivize the speculator. Remember, at the beginning of this interview, we talked about how we want to squash the speculator and bring up the hodler, bring mm. up the person who's in it for the, because he needs a loan or he needs a long-term income from the interest. So right. how do you, what mechanism do you use that also can work globally on a global basis, right? Like if I, if I did this with uh, any other mechanism and I had to pay somebody in Vietnam two cents that he earned on his uh, uh, one ether, right? Mm. How would I send it to him? If I send right. it to him by Visa or MasterCard or any money transfer, it will cost a dollar or two just to send it over. So the sell token is a perfect mechanism to, to create and distribute that value to anyone on the planet, even if they have $50 or $10, right? And that's why we don't have a minimum to join our community. You can join, your daughter can join the community, put $2 in there, and there's no fee, there's no initiation, there's no minimum, there's no monthly cost, and she will earn interest on two dollars. Right. You understand? So I understand. You, you cannot do that unless you control your own cost basis. And the only way to control our own cost basis is to create our own currency to do that. And the sell token is our own, you know, membership token that enables all of this. Right. Well, let's now talk about the dependency on the critical mass. What happens if we don't get to that magic number? Are you concerned at all about that? And what strategies we are you will, putting in place we, we to really build up, it? Right. We may end up with, uh, I don't know, 20 million members or 50 million members, and we will be a great store of value, but we will not become a, a form of payment, right? For, to become a form of payment, if you look at PayPal and you look at any of the other mechanisms that were born after Visa and MasterCard, they all reach hundreds of millions of users, right? So, so what's it going to take, Alipay, Alex? Look at Alipay, right? Alipay has close to a billion users. Right, mm. it's the seventh largest bank in the world right now with deposits over 300 billion in deposits. Right, so so that's what you need. You need a mass adoption, uh, like the M-Pesa in Kenya. That's a non-blockchain example of digital currency being used by the phone company. There, it's it's Safaricom uh, putting together a digital currency that has nothing to do with the central bank, nothing to do with the local government but it's exchanged one-to-one -one with the local currency, so everybody accepts it, right? So right. digital currencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, can act exactly in the same way. Now, M-Pesa is a very stable form of payment, but it's stable to the local currency. Compared to the dollar, it's moving like crazy. Mm. But for the local people who use it to, to pay for a taxi or buy an Apple or whatever, and they can do it on their phone, they don't see the volatility. So what we need to create is stability at the transaction level. It doesn't have to be stable against the dollar. It right. needs to be stable at the transaction level. Right. So you're creating the stability with the, the team you've got. And we will talk about your team in a moment because you have sections in your team that are, are quite outstanding and you put a lot of thought into the business and the tech. But just generally with regard to you know, the, the plan itself for your marketing, how you're going to World CryptoCon you know, tomorrow, I understand, or today, but how, more generally, how are you trying to build the narrative for those who don't know about crypto? How are you trying to engage? What's the media strategies to really stretch this beyond the small uh, community that is the crypto community currently in comparison to the rest of the people in the world? Well, so, so we employ many different mechanisms. I, first, uh, I speak at many conferences that are not crypto-centric. Uh, there may be blockchain conferences or tech conferences or finance conferences. Uh, for example, I'm going to be uh, at the SALT conference. SALT uh, is, is one of the best conferences, finance conferences in the world, one of the most prestigious. Uh, I spoke at the Milken Institute. It's, it's the most expensive conference. 
cost twenty five thousand dollars to buy a ticket to wow. attend, right? So, and it's a thousand of the richest people in the world show up there every year, and they talk about the most important issues. And as, uh, the Milking Conference, for example, uh, chose me to be on a panel with Nouriel Roubini and argue the merits of digital currency, right? And that, that's an example of me fighting for the community. And anyone who wants to see it, just uh, uh, looked at, uh, just do a search on Google, Crypto Brawl, uh, with my last name, Mashinsky, and you will see the, the hour-long debate with Nouriel Roubini. Yes, yeah, so I've watched it. Um, it was quite interesting. Yeah. But what I found the most interesting of all of the brawl was the fact that he was paid. So that is important for the audience to understand yes. as well is that when you're paid money to go on a stage, that can skew truth, that can screw agenda and it can yes. skew motivation to be there. And that is important to know because you did not get paid and he did. Right, right. And, and look, again, I, my job is to educate people or at least introduce them to the idea. Uh, I'm sure that not everything I say is 100% accurate and other people who are going to look at what I say are going to say, oh, I don't agree with this or that and they're going to have their own truth. But the point is, but most people today don't know what, what uh, crypto is. They don't know what the blockchain is. They think it's some scary, mathematical, complex thing that they can't understand. And I'm trying to explain to them, no. Just like, look, now most people I talk to uh, on, on the VoIP channel, like you, couldn't explain to me how VoIP works, mm -hmm. right? Most people wouldn't be able to tell me how it runs either on TCP IP or UDP and how the packets get assembled and how it translates back into voice and how, how does a speaker know how to actually pull it out as a Same voice. Same as blockchain. <laughs> Many people who are going to be using blockchain won't need to <laughs> so know. The point is you works. don't need to know. You don't need to know, you know how it works to use it. Same thing. We need to make the service. What we try to do with Celsius Network with the wallet is hide all this complexity and be able to go to a three-year-old and say, hey, Send, send some money to your parent. Let's see if you can get away with it. And Apple does, does that phenomenally well. And we, we basically watch how they're doing it. And we try to make the world as seamless, as transparent. And as right. Easy. Well, Alex, teach us that exactly. strategy. Teach us that Apple strategy that you know, you're replicating because we were starting to move there. You were suggesting that you know, you're going to these major conferences. That's you. But now let's talk in context of your team. You have an exceptional business-oriented team in that part. What's yeah. the strategy to really bring this so into the Yeah, everybody on our team uh, is an accomplished entrepreneur. Many of them have done several companies. And, and, and we're using both the advisor, like if you can look at uh, Miko, who's the founder of Evercoin. If you look at Scott Tornetta, who, as you mentioned, invented the blockchain. Uh, and we have many, many other uh, very reputable advisors who, again, have very broad exposure into the tech community and into the millennial community community and so on. And, and we're going to use influencers, we're going to use a, uh, uh, business events, we're going to use TV, we're going to use radio, everything, podcast, I'm starting a podcast channel uh, to educate people, bring them into this, explain to them why it's in their best interest. I mean, the most important thing here is that they have to really distinguish between the companies that are doing it just to generate profit for themselves and the companies that are doing this to build uh, the future and build it for the uh, next generation, right? So, right. so you know, like, and you can see very quickly, like, you can, I think you can smell the, the people who are just lining their pockets from the people who want to do good for the world, right? There, there are not a lot of us. So, right. for example, we make announcement about how we join the United Nations and how we're doing things for sustainable development and how we are giving our services for free while our competitors are talking about how they raise $50 million from a billionaire who they're going to pay 15% to borrow money from. If they're paying 15% for their money, how are they going to give you loans at 5%? Right. Understand? So there's a fundamental conflict there that, that you know sooner or later they're going to have to charge you more or somehow they're going to get more fees from you and you're not going to pay whatever they're telling you you're going to pay. So again, what is your mission? Why are you here? What, what, what are you going to do it for? And, and, and we modeled it uh, uh, on, on very successful institutions that have been doing this for a long time, learning mm. that their best practices and applying them to Celsius. Absolutely. Well, Alex Mashinsky, you are the CEO of Celsius Network. You've taught us all a great deal today. It's been very enlightening. One of the things I've learned from you in this one hour is that it's not just that you're bringing banking to blockchain because there are others that are trying to do that, but you're doing that in the context of bringing benevolence in with it. And that's a big difference. 
So thank you very much for your time. Is there anything you'd like to add in case we've missed anything at all that you really want to address to the community as they come to better understand exactly what you're all about? So the, 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 mo the biggest ask I have for every one of your viewers is really the call to action, right? Is, is if, you, if you listen to this AMA, you went on other ones, you viewed stuff, you learned about the blockchain, and you're really excited about it, you need to go and educate 10 other people, right? Like uh, what I do is I just send $5 to 10 people every day, people that are, have nothing to do with the blockchain, right? And, and when they get that experience, they suddenly own a bit, a bit of Bitcoin or a bit of Ethereum, they melt away. All that resistance that you see from people just melts away. And that's what I invite all of your viewers to do that because if you want to build this community, it's about inviting people and taking the first step and showing them that you, that you really want to do good for them. It's not about you gaining something. It's about doing good for someone else who's your friend, who's your neighbor, who even may be your enemy because humanity as a whole is all built on good deeds. It's not built on bad deeds. Right? And, right, and we don't have enough of that around us, and it doesn't take a lot. You know, it it does not take a lot in in uh, in in to, to make it a better place. Absolutely, I mean, well said. And obviously, you stand for transparency. It'll be interesting to talk to you further as you evolve, as you emerge, as arguably one of the more uh, benevolent representatives of the blockchain, one of the ones who are trying to do social good and also trying to bring banking into the, the conversation of crypto. So thank you again for your time, Alex. I would really like to speak to you again, um, you know, perhaps in a few months when we can talk about some developments. But until then, this is Alex Mashinsky letting you know all about what, what the Celsius Net Network stands for. And if you'd like to know more, certainly go to their website or go to any of their social media to learn more. Thank you for your time, Alex. Thanks for having us.